recorded. And all right. Oh, so no And we're live. Welcome, everybody. I see the numbers going up. So everyone's rolling in. There's always this like awkward two seconds where I don't know whether the webinar is started or not. Uh, but numbers are, are looking good. So um, we'll we'll get going uh, with Henning just in a minute. Um, let's uh, let's just like take a, an extra sixty seconds so that people can roll in. Um, in the meantime, um, you know, for everyone who missed it, we launched PlatformCon about a month ago and we just wrapped up the, the lineup today. There's about 60, 70 talks um, in, the, in the lineup. Um, and uh, welcome everyone. And uh, this is the link. If you wanna go check it out, feel free to also post where you're, where you're joining in from. Um, Shlomo is saying hello um feel free to to say where where you're posting in from the in, in the chat um the usual housekeeping rules um the session is recorded we'll share it tomorrow morning for email sorry ambulance uh police actually um and um henning will do a 20 30 minute session today um and then we'll open up the q a um however if you have um any Yes, can the first question already? Perfect. Q and A. Q and A is working well. Um, yes, you you'll get all the all the slides and the recording uh, tomorrow morning, uh, as I was saying. So uh, don't worry about that. You don't need to go uh, crazy on the on the note taking or anything. Um, and uh, over to Henning, who joined Zalando back in twenty ten. Help build a whole cloud infrastructure with Kubernetes, AWS, currently principal engineer on the infrastructure team. So knows a things or two about platforms and infrastructure. Uh, thanks so much for doing this, Henning. Um, oh, my pleasure. And I guess you had a couple of uh, polls that you wanted to run. So I'll, I'm trying these new things to crunch a few questions into one poll. So I'm launching it right now. Let's see what happens. Um, so hopefully, um, you guys can see that and um, and answer the different questions. Um, is that is that working out for everybody? Do you do you see that, Henny? Uh, I see the poll, but I cannot vote as a as a presenter. Yeah, I also <laughs> cannot vote. <laughs> but I see the votes are rolling in. Cool. Um, all right, so it seems like we have quite some SREs in the in the audience. Interesting. Um, yeah. Very interesting data. Okay. Um, maybe two more seconds. Cool. Very cool. All right. And also we have about two thirds who are working in the platform area or providing services for, for developers as internal customers. So that's really interesting. Awesome. All right. Well, I'll end the poll. I'll shut up and it's over to you, Henning. Okay. Yeah. Welcome everyone. Um, so nice to meet you. Um, also, hi, hi Shlomo. Nice to see you again or not see you, but from you. Um, so yes, uh, developer experience at Zalando. So um, Luca, thanks for the introduction. Maybe just a few words about myself. Uh, so I'm Henning. Um, I joined Zalando some time ago, so over 12 years now. And um, I was a head of developer productivity, so a platform team providing services for internal customers. Uh, but I also was uh, always somewhere in the platform infrastructure space or cloud engineer, um, more or less, uh, whatever the titles are these days. And um, yeah, if you learn, want to learn more about myself, um, I have a personal blog. There's also a, a blog post about 10 years in Orlando. If you want to read it, I just post it in chat. And you can find me on Twitter. You can also find me on Mastodon. So I don't know what the future of Twitter is. It doesn't look um, so bright, but let's go on with the presentation. So um, yeah, Talon's vision is to be the starting point for fashion. And um, that's um, something we as a European leading e-commerce uh, for fashion uh, already are kind of uh, working towards. And as you can see on the numbers for last year, um, we're not so small anymore. So when I joined 2010, um, the whole company was, I think, roughly 180 people. Now we are 17,000 in Europe. Um, and uh, with 10 billion revenue last year or 14 billion 
gross merchandise value. This is a considerable number. Um, just to give you some some yeah some color to uh, and context to my talk uh, today, we have 1.4 million uh, articles we sell to customers uh, in, in in our e-commerce shop. And uh, we're not just the fashion e-commerce, but we also have a lot of like kind of different areas. Uh, so we have our partner program connecting partners and customers um, uh, on a kind of marketplace uh, fashion. And uh, we also have a shopping club, which is lounge where you can get uh, huge discounts on, on certain items and campaigns. And, but we also have offline outlets um, where we sell um, uh, yeah, articles um, with, a, with a huge discount. And we connect um, offline brick and mortar stores with our connected retail solutions. Um, so there's a lot um, which you don't see as a normal Zalando customer, uh, which is basically the Zalando platform. And um, yeah, we want to talk about developer experience and tech. Um, so uh, we have a different tech hubs in Europe and Germany. So Berlin is our headquarter, but also Dortmund, Dublin, Helsinki, and Zurich um, are tech hubs. And we have over like roughly 2,000 engineers in tech and a lot of different engineering teams, delivery teams, and um, yeah, from all around the, the globe. So this means for us, um, when we talk about platform engineering, um, uh, yeah, we have uh, quite a few developers. Um, so I don't know the concrete number right now, but between 1,000 and 2,000 uh, developers, we have over 200 development teams and a lot of applications to take care of. Um, and this can look quite um, distinct. So for example, um, just to give you some impression, this is a graph uh, generated from application dependencies. Um, so this is um, like kind of different connections, for example, via API or e event calls between services in our tech landscape. Just to give you an impression um, what we talk about when I talk about um, Zalando Tech. And um, of course, um, uh, we adopted the you build it, you run it uh, mindset, which is something not so new. Um, later, it was coined DevOps uh, by some people, but I think you build it, you run it is older from 2006. And um, you build it, you run it is uh, certainly about taking end to end ownership for your systems. And this also means that you not only um, are taking end to end ownership of your systems uh, in day to day operations, uh, but also being basically uh, responsible for on call and taking the pager. So um, there's this nice quote from this increment Mac, not sure who um, uh, read the increment on call uh, magazine. Um, um, this is really, uh, I think, the essence that you also need to um, yeah, run your systems and be fully responsible with on call. So that's kind of for some context on, on Zalando, but we want to talk about developer experience. So we have to talk about our developer console, developer portal we built in, inside Zalando. We had the um, first iteration of our developer portal, and um, now we build it our uh, next iteration, which is based on Backstage by Spotify. Uh, you probably already know it. It's also in the CNCF. And um, this is called Sunrise in Zalando. And Sunrise is, as you can see, uh, our vision was starting point for fashion. Uh, Sunrise should be the daily starting point for builders. So this is really the place to go for our builders. Um, and with builders, I mean software, data engineers, and managers, also applied uh, data engineers, um, applied scientists, data scientists, and um, also project managers, um, software engineers, SRE, uh, whoever is uh, involved in building uh, software. And yeah, this is a starting point for builders. I want to show you a little bit. Um, so um, if you look at the bottom, before we had this quite a fragmented experience, and this might be the same in, in other companies that you like scale out and uh, grow, and then you have a tool set growing and a lot of different tools. Um, so this is um, really like kind of aggregating all the different information and making it discoverable, discoverable for everyone and increasing developer happiness, builder happiness and productivity. So let's have a quick look at how this looks like. So this is the homepage of, of our Sunrise uh, portal. And as you can see, this is quite dynamic. So it shows you actually the recent pipeline activity and this is personalized. So this is what actually uh, you're involved in. Pipelines, for example, you triggered or your author pull request or GitHub issues. Um, and also on the right side here, you can see already some software delivery uh, metrics. Not everyone is integrated there, but for example, the deployment frequency uh, is directly shown. And also some other context information um, is on this homepage. 
So this is really something where you worked as a developer on recently and you can jump right in to the pipeline or um, GitHub issues. Um, when you look at the sidebar, you can see what Sunrise offers actually for builders. So there are applications, APIs, there's um, a lot of different tools and I want to uh, quickly go through some of them, not all of them. And um, yeah, the most prominent feature of Sunrise is the search as everyone is used to web search. Also Sunrise search is uh, frequently used. And um, yeah, you can search quite different um, information via Sunrise and um, first and foremost documentation. Um, so here, for example, I just search for Postgres and I find different documentation sites um, of internal uh, teams. For example, our cloud native application runtime and database um, documentation, but also linking to the, our open source blog post about Postgres. So aggregating all the different um, information sources in one place. We can also search for application and that's um, um, yeah, uh, pretty uh, frequently used. I use it, I think uh, myself every day. And um, if we search for something like card, we will frequently find a lot of different applications and services uh, which are related to, to card or shopping card. And uh, then we can directly see who is the owner, jump into more information, issues, get support, et cetera. I'll go into applications uh, a bit later. Um, but we can also search APIs. So we have our RESTful API guidelines, which are linked here at the bottom. And um, APIs can also directly be searched in Sunrise. Uh, so for example, if we search for something like Kubernetes clusters, we can actually find APIs. So here it's not the top most search result, but actually the fourth. And we can find the cluster registry where we can get more information about Kubernetes clusters and directly jump into um, the Swagger API, the open APIs uh, definition, and can um, now use this API from our own tools to, to get Kubernetes clusters, for example. Applications, I already mentioned. So applications, um, I mean, the software catalog, that's a um, prime feature of Backstage, um, the open source uh, tool by Spotify. Uh, we customized it a little bit. So we, we call them applications in Zalando. And um, so we have the software catalog integrated here in Sunrise. And we have different uh, features there. For example, applications have a certain criticality, like a tier, tier one, tier two, tier three. Um, of course, description, different tags, which are auto-detected. So for example, what JVM runtime is used. Uh, and we also have application reviews, um, which badly help to assess um, the correctness of the metadata and, um, and make sure that uh, ownership is still correct and other information. And um, yeah, if we jump into application details, um, we have basically all the in, important information at hand. There is, of course, still a lot more to integrate, but you can already see that we have the links to documentation, the ownership of applications um, is clear, whoever goes there. Um, and we have links to, for example, open tracing, to application logs, to Grafana dashboard, and a lot of other inf information which are relevant for, for the application. So um, step by step, we are also integrating all the different infrastructure tools we have. So for example, we use Nakadi, which is our internal event bus uh, for eventing uh, between applications. So we can badly go to the Nakadi events tab and we directly see uh, statistics about different event types um, emitted by the applications, but also um, which application um, subscribes to which event types. Um, so we directly see statistics on how many events per second are published here. And this is badly directly provided by the Nakadi team. So this is badly not one team doing the developer console, um, but that's something different teams contribute to this platform. Um, documentation search I already showed. So this is just like a, like a search a result badly going directly to, to documentation. This is also like uh, integrated into Backstage by Spotify directly and, um, and based on make docs so we can directly uh, browse the documentation and make um, changes uh, via the GitHub links. Product portfolio, that's something specific to Zalando. So um, builders um, frequently need to know what's actually the state of different platform products. So for example, we have our API linter, we have API monitoring, we have Airflow as a service provided by a different team. So all these different products um, are sometimes phased out, sometimes uh, there are new product appearing. So the product portfolio barely gives transparency uh, for internal builders, what is available where and what the status, if it's now on adopt or maybe it's phased out. Um, and who to contact for more information or the direct link to documentation. 
So of course, um, this is not just about systems and applications and documentation. We need uh, frequently to collaborate with other people so we can search for people. I already showed the search um, and we can also find teams and, and people um, on Sunrise directly so we can see who is in the team and um, how many applications they have. Um, so we can definitely extend this in the future, um, but that's already the basic um, functionality for teams and people. Yeah, and something which is the most frequently used um, page on, on Sunrise is actually the continuous delivery platform. So our CICD tooling, which is built in-house. And um, that's something I'll also come back to later, um, but that's, I think, what um, is frequently used to trouble uh, shoot something uh, deployed or uh, watching a CICD pipeline or approving something. So that's, I think, the most visited page on Sunrise, the CICD pipeline. Mm, something uh, which is uh, not to be missed on a developer console or starting point for builders is certainly like how to get support. So there is a dedicated support page. So if someone needs support with their Windows laptop or a Linux laptop or uh, whatever it is, um, they can uh, go to the support page and then all the different ticket systems, which are actually, um, yeah, the different ticket systems, for example, GitHub Enterprise. Uh, issues, but also uh, Jira tickets sometimes. So this is not completely standardized right now, um, are directly linked here. So people know where to go and get support. So this is just to give you some overview of the developer console like Sunrise. And um, yeah, certainly we want to aggregate all the different information and tooling uh, for builders in one place. And the mission is really to make it, um, yeah, uh, integrate all the builder experience in Sunrise. And um, what is really important to understand um, from our strategy is that Sunrise is a, a multi-sided platform. So we have both providers. Providers can be something uh, like could be a team like Nakadi, which you already saw the Nakadi event uh, team provided the tab for Nakadi events. There are also um, other teams like machine learning platform, which integrate into Sunrise. So these are all providers and uh, the consumers are basically the builders. And um, this is really the multi-sided uh, platform approach we have with Sunrise. Um, and this works great so far. I think we have like five or six teams now contributing as providers. And um, as you can see, like nearly all of the deep builders in Zalando use Sunrise. So let's quickly look through the developer um, experience um, and journey. Um, this uh, is definitely familiar sounding for Shlomo, I guess. Um, and we can uh, look at the different stages. So I'll just give a quick run through. The tech radar is certainly something um, which you might already know that Zalando created this visualization, which is also integrated in a Spotify plugin. So we also use it. Um, so it's <laughs> basically a nice, um, nice cycle. We created this visualization, then there's this backstage plugin, and now this visualization is in the backstage plugin and we use it again. And we also have our tech radar um, documentation with more information about the different uh, technologies. Uh, so this certainly helps to like plan and uh, see what technologies are chosen and uh, how we do, uh, build software. Um, but then, if we actually need to start, uh, we should be easy to uh, it should be easy to get started. So we have application bootstrapping and application templates. We probably have seen already the golden path approach by Spotify. Uh, we don't have golden paths uh, marked specifically right now, but we have application templates and this can certainly develop into like more like golden path um, uh, ways in the future. And um, yeah, if we want to create a new application, um, we can create a new service directly with this uh, tooling and then get a new repository set up uh, for example, for Java 11 Spring Boot, and can directly start to develop here. And all the CI CD integrations are already done. Yeah, when we talk about deployments and cloud native, um, there is something um, like the kit on the block is, is Kubernetes. So let's see how this works in Zalando. Um, when we have this new repo set up with all the different um, files and, for example, Java source files, we also have the deployment configuration in there. And this is all like based on really kind of GitOps um, YAML files in the same repository. So we have a deploy apply folder, we have a delivery YAML file, which is a CI CD configuration. And then all the configuration is basically in the, all the different YAML files. So for example, the Ingress YAML defines uh, where the uh, application is available. We use our own Ingress controller, which is open source. We use Skipper as a proxy, which is also open source. And this badly um, 
wires everything in the background. So you just define the DNS name and then get the host name uh, with SSL and DNS um, and OAuth um, yeah, available in, in the endpoint you would specify here. Um, similarly, we extended um, um, Kubernetes with our custom CRD. So we have our Postgres operator. So if you, do, you define a uh, want a Postgres database, you basically have a custom resource definition is a, another YAML file for our Postgres operator and then get, um, get this automatically provisioned on your Kubernetes cluster. Um, similarly, we have integrations for OWASP tokens with uh, platform credentials, how we call them. And so we get um, OWASP clients and OWASP tokens in, injected as secrets in Kubernetes. And that's again, as a custom CRD um, in, in, in our world. And it's just defined in this deploy apply folder. Uh, another example would be scheduled scaling. This is provided by our cube metrics adapter. So we have, for example, in launch, we have uh, daily campaigns where we need to scale up. And for example, they start seven in the morning and uh, we can define those high traffic events in one CRD and then applications can subscribe to the scaling event and be scaled up based on time. Um, you might ask, so we have all these different YAMLs. How do we actually manage all these YAMLs and migrations between Kubernetes versions? So we don't have um, anything higher level than mustache templating right now. Um, and I think it's not so bad as it might sound in the first place, because uh, what we do is automated PRs for, for different um, migrations. For example, here are two examples where we needed to um, upgrade something for Kubernetes 116. So this is a little bit older, as you can imagine, uh, but also, for example, the Conjob API needed to be updated for a new Kubernetes version. So this is how we uh, badly do, do updates um, across all the different teams. So as you can mention, imagine 200 plus teams, and then they get automated PRs. And it's their responsibility. Again, you build it, you run it, whether they want to merge the PR, how they test it, that it works. Uh, but it's barely provided centrally that this, um, these changes are done for teams to remove toil. So I already mentioned AWS. Um, in one slide and um, at least CloudFormation is another interface teams have. So we have CloudFormation YAML files in the same folder as, as Kubernetes manifest. And then this, this will be also bootstrapped or uh, updated on AWS side. So Kubernetes manifest and CloudFormation uh, stacks. This is basically the, the main um, interface for, for teams, uh, how they get interact with the cloud native application runtime. So how does the deployment look like? So if we look at the Sunrise CICD, um, UI again, then the deployment looks like this. So um, Kubernetes files and cloud, uh, CloudFormation manifests are applied. And as you can see here, you have basically the tree of different resources. You can also expand and collapse the deployment with replica sets and pods. You can directly click on, on logs and cube web view and then get more information if something is failing. And also similarly, the CloudFormation is directly applied here and you can click on it and go to the AWS console. Um, so it's all on, in one place. So the question is, how do we deploy to what um, on, on AWS? So we deploy to many different clusters. So we have maybe uh, 90 different cluster pairs uh, right now. And each cluster is in one AWS account. So it's always a pair of prod and non-prod clusters. Um, and these are grouped by so-called product communities. It's not like kind of really well-defined, but as you can imagine, there's something like a logistics area. There's something maybe like platform infrastructure. And these have uh, different clusters. Um, and then they also manage their access to their cluster. Uh, there's uh, this blog post by me about like how we manage the different Kubernetes clusters. Um, yeah, feel free to check it out. Yeah, um, maybe one more word about the Kubernetes setup. Um, so we use um, namespaces um, and we use team namespaces in the past, but that's really a stupid idea. Um, so we try to uh, move towards application namespaces and we have uh, standardized mandatory labels on Kubernetes uh, called application component env environment. Um, yeah, and um, that's maybe um, something which um, we should have done correct from the start, but now we move to application namespaces. Okay, let's have a look at you build it, you run it and operations. Of course, we have Grafana as probably everyone has in some form and uh, people have um, Kubernetes application dashboards automatically provisioned so they can just select their application. And this is pretty standard, I would say. As you can see, there is also deployment events integrated here. You can see this with this uh, red dotted line. So you can directly see, oh, there was a deployment happening and maybe something is going weird or CPU uh, usage is going up or something. So 
This is quite helpful for troubleshooting. Logs are in Scala, which is a SaaS vendor, and um, logs can directly be browsed across um, across different teams and namespaces in, in, in the Scala account. Um, and we have uh, Kubernetes app view deployed, um, which is like a, just a web tool, um, kubectl for the web, I would say. And um, you can daily explore pods and um, all the different resources here. Um, and initially this was created because um, no tool so far really supported a lot of different clusters. So kubectl also allows you to search across all the different clusters. Um, it's not necessarily always fast, but at least it's possible, um, which is already something. Um, and there's also a dark mode, but it's not so important. And um, one thing I wanted to highlight is um, that, of course, teams need access to the Kubernetes cluster. So uh, for emergency reasons like incidents, but also some manual operations, um, this they can also um, get via our um, kubectl wrapper. Um, so they can badly request emergency access and then um, directly use the Kubernetes API on the command line or with other tools. Um, and um, this is then following four eyes and linking to the incident ticket. Uh, so making this um, like a compliant, compliant way to get access. Similarly, this is also used for port forwarding um, and, and other special cases. Okay. Um, yeah, when we talk about developer experience, there's always um, something uh, which which everybody is kind of looking into, and even on the Thoughtworks tech radar. Uh, so, which is the the four uh, four metrics uh, from the Accelerate book, software delivery performance. Um, and I want to briefly talk about this. So, we also try to measure this. Um, this is how we measure it right now. So, um, sorry, next slide. Um, this is actually maybe the reason why you should look at the four uh, metrics uh, because this is actually in the end helping organizational performance. But this is how we measure this actually in Zalando. So uh, commit to production is measured um, by our team code. Uh, we measure the deployment frequency, which is relatively straightforward. Uh, mean time to restore the service is coming from incident tickets. And um, the change fail rate is right now not so optimal. Basically, we use a proxy metric, which is incident, uh, the ratio of incidents uh, and deployments. Um, Okay, and um, yeah, well, these, these metrics we have on a um, so-called Accelerate dashboard, which is not right now integrated in Sunrise. So this would be something uh, we still need to, to integrate, um, but there is basically a, a different BI tool where people can explore the different software delivery performance metrics in these dashboards and drill down um, to teams, etc. Okay, I'll do a quick check on the questions. Um, just maybe see if I uh, changed anything or already answered something. Um, okay, there is something about spec stage. I'll answer this afterwards. Um, can you give an estimate on the ratio between business teams and those building and running platform and infrastructure? Um, that's a good question. Um, that's um, a very good question. Um, I don't have the concrete number because um, right now, like barely all the engineering teams are part of business teams. So there's no like clear separation between you know, business areas and IT or something. Um, but uh, probably your question is also related to the platform teams. So platform teams, um, I don't get me wrong, but maybe it's 100 plus people depends on um, on who you really um, see as a platform team because they also provide like huge uh, business value, for example, by providing base functionality uh, regarding ML platform um, for other tooling. So I would say um, it's not so easy to distinguish this right now, um, but yeah, uh, good question. Um, stack set, um, traffic switching, that's something Ah, so I see also uh, questions in chat. So maybe you can just use the Q&A. That would be easier. Either way, I'll lose the questions in chat. Then I can also mark them as answered. Um, that would be great. Um, so something which, where we adopted actually um, our custom tooling is um, our stack set controller uh, to allow gradual traffic switching on Kubernetes. So by default, there is no such thing on Kubernetes. Um, and um, this is done via our stack set controller, which you can also find open source. 
Um, and this allows us to badly really do uh, gradual traffic switching. For example, say 20% of traffic goes to the green stack and 80% to the blue one. The stack set is, uh, is a CRD, which looks relatively straightforward. It's just another wrapper around um, about deployments. And uh, you barely have a stack template. And then the stack template has a spec with a pod template. Um, and it also integrates the ingress um, definition here. Uh, but it's nothing kind of um, totally strange or like relying on um, kind of service mesh functionality or anything like this. So it's really just a, like a higher level order um, a wrapper around deployments and ingress to make this traffic switching happen. And of course, you need also something which in, um, implements this traffic switching. You can use different tools. Um, in our case, we use Skipper for the um, for the gradual traffic switching. Uh, Skipper is then our HTTP proxy. And um, this, of course, is then also something you integrate and use with CDP, our continuous delivery platform. So here is one example where, where a team deploys something, has different testing stages, and then um, a smoke test stage, and then um, like slowly switches traffic, production five, like would be 5% of traffic switched to the new stack. And then in the end, 100% of traffic to the new, new production stack. So this is basically some functionality which you don't get out of the box on Kubernetes. Uh, because there is no such thing as traffic switching uh, by out of the box. Um, something we highly um, rely on is um, open tracing, um, and we use Lightstep for for open tracing. So this is like a SaaS vendor, and we send the spans to to Lightstep. Um, this is just like a, a screenshot showing one span. There's a lot more we do with open tracing. For example, to discover these application dependencies, I showed you this. Um, this graph of all the different service connections. This is, for example, um, um, yeah, this is analyzed via open tracing, but we also have adaptive paging where there are also talks um, out there from SREcon, um, which allow us to smartly like alert the right team when something breaks. Um, yeah, I mentioned in the in the webinar I invite um, uh, some mention of, of compliance. So um, that's always um, worth talking about, like at least in in certain in organizations of a certain size. How do you make this uh, happen? So in the end, we have a lot of different mechanisms for uh, ensuring compliance. So first and foremost, we have a asset register, which is like kind of all the different applications, and they have all the different attributes like ownership, also criticality, also data criticality, and we have a tool set around application reviews to make it to make sure that we um, yeah actually review our applications uh, frequently and also check if they follow our good practices, for example, have alerts defined, have tracing instrumentation and so on in there. Um, we have four um, ICE mandatory approval for pull requests. So I didn't show this earlier, but every change is barely going through two engineers. Uh, one of the engineers can be the author of the code itself. Um, and uh, we have certain rules of play. So for example, we have approved Docker images, so you cannot deploy anything to production, uh, which is not coming from um, our own registry and there's an approved base image. Um, and we have a certain set of mandatory policies on Kubernetes, for example, labels and AWS tags. And I showed you already the emergency access, which is um, uh, yeah, providing badly people access to the Kubernetes API if they need to, but by default, everything is done via Git and CI CD. And in case of an emergency, then uh, maybe someone needs to do a, a JMAP or whatever. JVM uh, heap dump or whatever is needed on on uh, on a live pod. Okay, um, there is uh, one more thing, and there is actually a lot more things <laughs> we are planning and building up. Uh, one uh, thing which is already released, and there is a nice blog post about this, uh, is our machine learning platform. And the machine learning platform is now nicely integrated into Sunrise. So this is a prime example of how this multi-sided platform works. So there is a team which is kind of really not. Um, focused on kind of classical cloud native Kubernetes and so on, uh, but uh, actually a, a around data engineering and applied scientists. Um, and this is now all integrated in, in Sunrise and probably provide experiments, integration with JupyterHub, Databricks, uh, SageMaker, and so on. Um, so this is definitely um, a very nice addition to Sunrise, the portal, even though I'm personally not using a machine learning platform right now because um, uh, I'm just not a um, the audience right now, and uh, this is a pretty cool integration. Um, yeah, what else for the developer experience? So we um, 
we, we measure developer happiness, but we also um, actually communicate frequently with our uh, customers. And um, we have a builder newsletter, how we call it, and this is going out every month. And um, this is actually content source from all different teams. So we don't want to kind of have actually newsletter by team um, or something like this, but really focus on uh, what the customer, in this case, internal um, builders need. Um, so this is really about new features, what can people now do um, in Sunrise, um, telling them like, check out this, um, this feature, which makes your life easier. And um, that's something um, yeah, we create every month and goes out. Yeah, um, wrapping up. Um, so I think you build it, you run it. That's um, like the way to go uh, nowadays anyway. So that's not any news. Um, so we created Sunrise as a starting point for builders. We certainly still have um, a long way to go to uh, really integrate all the builder experience. But as you can see, there's um, quite some way we already uh, made progress. So um, this is uh, getting better every week. So this is really nice to say, see. Uh, we use Kubernetes manifest and CloudFormation files um, as an interface for our builders. And um, we extend Kubernetes with our own CRDs, so like for example, credentials, Postgres, Stackset, uh, scheduled scaling, and and other um, features. So this is a nice um, uh, yeah, attribute of Kubernetes to be extensible. Um, and we try to have compliance by default, so people don't, should not like kind of read a book on what to do right, but actually just uh, do the right thing by default, uh, because the tooling and the UI is fairly streamlined. And um, yeah, we measure builder happiness and software delivery performance. Um, to get uh, better over time and badly get really the best out for our developers and make them productive and um, yeah, remove toil uh, and uh, build leverage for our organization. So that's kind of um, already it. And I see there are a lot of questions. Uh, you can find more information. I uh, already linked some of the uh, things on my slides, but engineeringzalando.com is our engineering blog. There are public um, talks linked on uh, GitHub, Zalando public presentations. So feel free to check them out. And um, yeah, over to your questions and I'll check the Q&A. Thank you, Henning, that was great. Um, I think people really enjoyed it, lots of questions. Um, so I think we can start with the, uh, maybe just there's one interesting question also in the chat by Julia. And then once we go through that, we can, then we have the Q&A and as Henny was saying, please everyone just like drop your stuff in the Q&A so we have only one list to look at. Mm -hmm. um, but Julia brought something that I think is interesting because it's something that's coming up in the platform engineering Slack channel as well quite often, which is how often is that Accelerate dashboard used and who are the main viewers? And so in his experience, uh, individual contributors don't look that often at that kind of data or mistrust it. And uh, would you say it's basically worth doing this metric collection? Um, is it worth the price? And, and can you give a concrete examples of, of when, when it's used as a lander? Um, yeah, that's a very good question. So um, it's certainly like always like a, a cultural topic and it's um, also something where we don't want to, you know, like track individuals and, uh, oh, you didn't commit code this week. That's like kind of, oh, what did you do? But maybe there is like kind of uh, other things you can do as engineer. So it's like not that uh, you're paid by lines of code you write, right? Um, so I think the Accelerate uh, dashboard is certainly like the audience as engineering managers. Of course, like all the individual contributors can also look at it, for example, principal engineers to see like what is the difference of, of teams in their area and uh, where maybe teams um, struggle or also um, uh, need help. For example, um, uh, code reviews is something we identified as, some, um, as something where we, for example, sometimes lack the right tooling to get um, notifications outright. I mean, everybody in theory can use GitHub notifications, but I, I think a lot of people struggle with this overload, right? There are all the different tools, emails, chats, GitHub, and so on. Um, so this is, for example, something we identified in the past where um, uh, where things fall through the cracks because there is not enough um, kind of uh, reaction on, for example, a new PR opened. And uh, this is also, for example, one angle we are, we are taking on, in, 
and code contributions across teams, uh, which we want to make make easier. And Sunrise, for example, is a prime example where where the owning team of Sunrise provides a platform where providers can quickly contribute and where something is getting reviewed and out um, quickly. And this is, for example, one one gap we identified where where like low long like fairly stale PRs or something you know like not. Um, Deadly progressing is contributing to the lead time, for example. Um, but yeah, you're right. Um, there's always like this culture aspect, and um, maybe individual contributors are not too interested in, in looking at this data. Um, but they're maybe also not the, the right audience. And I think going forward, we will also provide more kind of um, instruction for engineering managers what to look at, not only for Accelerate, but also for other metrics. For example, cloud cost would be something. Um, where we already have, have tooling around uh, cloud costs, which I didn't show now, but I think this can still be better to give really, yeah, better guidance for engineering management, what to look at, and the Accelerate dashboard would certainly be also something um, where it makes sense to, to look at periodically um, um, yeah, how, how teams are doing or where maybe something is. Um, for example, just work in progress limits are not really in place, right? So. Um, too much this done at the same time will not make you progress fast. Mm -hmm. um, I guess we can go back to the, um, the first question actually from Felix. Uh, maybe we can sort of join in with the second one by Marco. So, so Felix was asking, what did you adopt from backstage uh, and which parts would you recommend using and which not? And then Marco is asking what were the reasons to migrate to backstage in the first place from, from your internal problem that you had before? Yeah, I think um, what we adapted from backstage, so with the software catalog is certainly there, we have this tech docs um, I showed, and some other plugins, um, also like for example, I mean the software catalog was customized, also the tech radar plugin uh, I already showed. Um, I don't have the complete overview because I'm not a backstage developer, there is on the backstage homepage actually there is a link to a YouTube video of the community backstage call and there's um, one of our developers presenting a little bit what the challenges and learnings with backstage are. So you can find this uh, directly on the backstage uh, homepage when you go to the YouTube link. Um, yeah, but I, I wouldn't have like too much details on the on the inner working of backstage right now. But this next um, question I can actually um, is straightforward to answer. So what were the reasons to migrate from our own developer console? I think this was really about um, making it hard to contribute to this developer console and not getting enough traction. So it was really uh, not planned and um, architectured for this multi-sided platform, which we now have with Sunrise, where you really can do um, different plugins and different teams contribute, like Nakadi I showed, or the Postgres team providing their, their tab with the database uh, databases per application. Um, so there, there was kind of challenges around like, yeah, getting contributions and making progress on the developer console. So I think Backstage helped us a lot also with the community. And of course, there are other challenges. For example, Backstage is fast moving and there were a lot of things breaking um, as far as I understand. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, that's certainly a, a big step forward compared to our internal platform, internal developer console. Would you say that was the, the only sort of like main con for, for Backstage? the kind of like rapid development and hard to keep things together? Mm, yeah, I think the, the developer console was a little bit like becoming stale and um, it was hard yeah. to contribute if you're not a, like a front end developer. So um, it was really kind of only owned by one, one team and not designed for this um, contribution model, I would say. And of course you get like kind of plugins out for free from, from Backstage. Um, of course, on the other hand, you need to customize them because not everything fits your fits your needs directly. Um, but yeah, I think that we're now in a much better place than, than we were ever with, with our internal developer console. Yeah. Got it. Uh, jumping through here to the ones that got upvoted. So folks, if you want uh, questions to be asked, upvote because we have 16 in the backlog. I'm not sure we're going to get to all of them. But by the way, I know that for some events, um, we're coming up to the 45 minutes. Uh, we're happy to run over Henning, if that's cool with you. Um, yeah, so that's, that's yeah, we can run over another 10, 15 minutes, um, but yeah, go, go upvote stuff. Um, so Daniel um, was asking, what is your rule of thumb to decide whether you centralize the functionality or leave it up to the teams to implement it or state it differently, centralized services versus team autonomy? Yeah, we, 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 
definitely um that's i mean always a trade-off to make but i think um yeah we definitely value like um like proven processes over local optimizations i mean that's always a hard discussion to have right because some teams have created their local optimum solution um but this is maybe not uh, the optimum for the company so um i think there might be always like kind of exceptions and special needs um but i think uh, we are generally trying to le uh, leverage more like central services and um and not build the you know the 10 or 11 uh, version of of a bi or data warehouse or something like this so um i think yeah this is like hard discussions to have because the team who is affected by this because they maybe have a local optimal solution they say like why should i move um but this is on the on the company level with with our scale uh, that's not something like um, yeah, we uh, we can actually use going forward uh, because we really need to scale and make our um, engineers productive and badly generate leverage, which means having a, a few things where we have deep knowledge, which we can um, optimize and um, optimize this for a large number of teams. Um, when uh, when then um, yeah, this is really removing toil from engineers. Um, so I mean. Uh, Mainly the short answer is, of course, it's a case by case this, uh, discussion as always. But I think the general principle is we value um, yeah, proven global processes over like local uh, optimizations. Yeah, we we certainly see that a lot. The sort of tragedy of the commons, where uh, you know individual maybe something is great for the overall organization, but the individual team is kind of blocking it is something that we've seen a lot of times. Um, Rodolfo is asking, uh, do you happen to have an internal framework for delivering those updates to the internal YAML manifests? Is it mostly focused on making sure that the Zalando teams, I guess, uh, keep using the, the most up-to-date resource definitions, or are you delivering functionality and the best practices via those automated PRs? Yeah, I would say both. Um, I, I think right now it's mostly driven by initiatives or like by pure needs, for example, Kubernetes migrations, right? I mean, the central team is, of course, wanting to unblock uh, moving forward because we always like want to be um, pretty much on the not on the latest latest Kubernetes version but on the uh, pretty recent Kubernetes version I, and I think we are doing a good job um, so this is for example one trigger but also topics like cloud cost efficiency are something so we created automated pull requests to um, to reduce Kubernetes slack for example or add spot tolerations um, but yeah, you asked about the framework. I think there are maybe two right now. One, one something for for opening pull requests and and changes via Go, and one in in Python. But that's um, all relatively low level, so it's kind of it has certain rules, and then uh, they lead, applies diffs to to YAML files with a certain logic. Of course, it's not optimal because it's in the end still like text manipulation, um, but it works uh, pretty well. And because it's not Turing complete languages, we have in um, in all the or maybe YAML is too incomplete. I don't know. I haven't checked. But um, really, this is uh, relatively looking like standard files. We can apply these diffs and just make um, uh, yeah changes for exceptional cases where teams diverged from from the standard setup. Um, all right. Um, Shlomo um, was asking, uh, do you decide the size of the platform engineering org as a quota of overall engineers? Um, or by the size and complexity of the problems that need to be solved? Yeah, I think a quota, um, I don't know if this would make sense as a general statement to have a quota. I think it really depends on um, why we want to invest. For example, we create now a new team for builder knowledge management and where we see the clear need um, where this investment pays off um, to help us uh, barely make, make the whole organization more, more effective, right? So this, um, this investment, um, decisions are definitely case by case and not an overall quota uh, or a text decision but rather um, where it, yeah where it really pays off um, for example the um, ml productivity and machine learning platform as you can see um, is something where we struggled with a lot of different fragmented solutions in the past and now moving towards this um, also nicely integrated machine learning platform um, definitely uh, pays off um, and it's not something um, yeah someone would have seen as a quota right if you have a quota maybe you would have like to downsize and left a different team to to match the quota and um you definitely want to invest where it makes sense 
Shlomo also asking, uh, very good question, Shlomo. People seem to like yours. Um, are you only using CloudFormation for AWS or also CDK? And do you have an opinion on CDK? Yeah, that's a very good question because it's always always a discussion. Uh, so CDK is certainly used in Talando, but it's not directly supported in our continuous delivery platform right now. So this might change going forward um, with CDK support. So for example, um, yeah, the machine learning folks uh, use CDK and also um, in some other areas where the CDK is used for generation, but it's not directly supported in, in the platform tooling. Um, uh, out of the box right now um, but certainly it, it's in use um, so let's see how this evolves um, going forward uh, with AWS CDK mm -hmm. so Ziv is asking how do you measure success I mean you mentioned builder happiness um, and obviously the, the door metrics is, is is are those the core KPIs that you guys optimize against um, yeah, there is of course a number of different um, different KPIs we track and and measure, and it depends by by sub team, um, of course. Um, so it's definitely kind of this angle of providing uh, leverage. And um, so, for example, the machine learning platform team, um, as I already mentioned, uh, this probably is um, not so much affecting um, directly the Dora metrics for, for other builders. Um, so they uh, they need uh, maybe different KPIs. Um, but yeah, certainly um, the Dora metrics are one of them. And um, we barely, I didn't share this before, but I adopted one of the metrics or adapted them. So we barely track the deploy number of deployment days per week because uh, we don't want to uh, maximize the number of deployments overall. Um, I mean, this is also good and uh, also something we track, but we want to make sure that people deploy regularly and don't have like stale stale things um, flying around and making making it easier to um, get changes out. Um, so barely tracking the number of um, days a team deploys um, per week and, um, and targeting like kind of five, which is the um, number of work days in the regular week. Mm. Yeah, Marco is just sharing a Pulumi link. Um, let's see. Yeah, so Christian is asking how many engineers are involved in tooling, developing and maintaining the features of Sunrise. Is that uh, approximately 100 number that you were mentioning earlier? No, no. I mean, the 100, uh, 100 plus number would be like all the kind of infrastructure folks. And of course, Sunrise mm -hmm. is kind of the um the the developer console itself i don't know if it's like eight or ten people right now mm -hmm. I, I would have to check something like this or so a regular uh, one team um but of course um as said it's like a multi-sided platform so all the other teams for example the nakadi or postgres team um or infrastructure teams they also provide um uh, content for sunrise or not content but um kind of different views and features uh, so they're also contributing. So this Bailey team doesn't need to grow so much. They they provide the core of Sunrise and the framework, um, but actually the contributions should come from other teams, and then they um, provide the Sunrise features for for their um, for their builders. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Shlomo, I had a, uh, an interesting follow up. So for somebody just starting on their journey, would you recommend them to? Uh, focus on CDK or on cloud formation or in Terraform for AWS provisioning, asking for a friend? <laughs> I guess uh, that's a loaded question. So um, honest answer, would, I, I wouldn't know. Like, I think um, I'm not the right person to to provide uh, advice <laughs> to, to other people starting out on the journey with my, my history in Dolando. So yeah, I'm, I'm passing this on to, <laughs> to, to people who have uh, maybe started out the journey recently. I mean, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Um, Gabriel is asking, how do you deal with engineer onboarding? I'm guessing specifically to Sunrise. Um, yeah, I mean, right now we have a um, onboarding which is um, roughly three uh, three days, but we're also like uh, reshaping this. Um, and of course, Sunrise is definitely part of the whole onboarding. Um, uh, material and also has a dedicated session but um yeah um this is definitely uh, something we are looking at right now like how to um shape the onboarding because it's right now a lot of material and information at at um uh, at once and we want to pace it a little, little bit more and uh we for example right just right now 
now collected objectives of the different onboarding training and um, get this a little bit more streamlined. So I'm not sure if this would be answer to your question, but yeah, Sunrise is certainly part of the onboarding and should be the starting point for builders. So uh, they should know how to get support, how to search something um, before they badly, you know, reach out to individuals and asking a question in a, in a chat. Yeah. Um, what maybe we can do some some final uh, rapid fire in the last five minutes. So, what do you use for your CI/CD pipelines? Um, yeah, like I mentioned before, it's uh, our continuous delivery platform, which is uh, built in house, so nothing um, open source. Uh, we started with this um, at a time where, where there was nothing kind of out there in the open source space um, apart from Jenkins, and we used Jenkins and were not happy with it, and it was hard to manage. Um, so, basically, we created our continuous delivery platform uh, years ago. And he moved it. Okay. All right. Um, maybe let's do let's do a couple couple last ones. Mm -hmm. um, we have Ralph. Um, so saying you build, you run it. Are your teams allowed to step out of the framework you're offering to them if they think and prove that their way to run their products actually better fits their case than your framework does? So I guess how flexible is your framework really? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I would say, I mean, there are some exceptions, for example, for teams running vendor software, we sometimes make exceptions because I mean, vendor software often comes with um, special requirements and you can only get support if it's run in a certain way. So that would be one angle where there are certainly exceptions. Um, but that being said, um, I would say like most of the things um, we run, um, if it's like order processing, logistics, um, um, AI, um, front ends, et cetera, um, I mean, can run in some form on AWS and or Kubernetes. Um, so there is, really, if you mean framework, there is um, yeah, certainly not kind of the strictest set of um, rules because it's still in the end like a cloud native application runtime and a lot of managed services and probably no one on earth can name all the different AWS services available. Of course, they also need to follow the compliance rules. So um, yeah, I would say um, there is like kind of um, some exceptions, for example, for vendor software, um, but I still have to see like kind of something which completely falls outside of, of like kind of more or less our cloud native um, application landscape. Mm -hmm. um, is everything run in Kubernetes or do you run on VMs as well? Um, no, everything is run on Kubernetes. So I think whatever 90 X percent, I think 90, whatever, 70, 97%. There are, like I said, some exceptions for things run directly on EC2. Like um, for example, GitHub Enterprise itself is run on, on EC2 directly. Um, and there is also still like a small number of legacy apps. For example, I think we still have um, a Cassandra cluster on EC2 running directly, but we'll move away from that because it's also operational burden. Um, to more managed services. Um, so yeah, you can basically say um, nearly everything is running on Kubernetes. Um, of course, there are other like platforms. For example, we use Databricks, which is kind of a managed um, managed platform. Um, and then kind of, yeah, these are different, uh, different stories then. All right, well, I guess we can, we can uh, end on the beginning. Uh, so when was the platform engineering uh, or when was platform engineering in general introduced as a Lambda? Since you were there from the beginning, pretty much. Um, yeah, I think like when I started, there was, I mean, there's always something <laughs> platform, right? When I started, this was still, still called SysOp, so system operators. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then I think in 2012, we have had, or 2011, 2012, we had platform teams, which were called platform software, platform system, and so on. So you could call this platform engineering. Later, this was called platform engineering, uh, platform infrastructure. And then um, now this is kind of builder infrastructure. And then 2017, for example, we created this developer productivity area, uh, which is really focusing on, on developers as, as customers, also like hiring the first product manager in this area. So depending on what you really mean with platform engineering, I would say um, this like the first real platform teams in the sense existed in 2011, 2012. But like kind of this product mindset for platform teams um, started with 2017 and later. And I mean, I remember actually hosting one of the, our very first webinars a year and a half ago with Jan Löffler, uh, who is also 
um, part of the kind of Zalando platform engineering journey in the, in the early days. Yes. Um, yeah. Um, awesome. Well, um, I mean, thank, thank you, Henning, uh, for a great talk. I think people really enjoyed it. Um, we still have over 50 people hang, that hang out with us until the end, so, so it's great. Um, I guess, you know, we couldn't get to all the questions. So if you uh, want to reach Henning, uh, you know, we'll share again in the follow-up email, Twitter, and, and everything that, that you shared in the, in the first slides. Um, but also I'll drop in here the link of the platform engineering Slack channel um, where uh, Henning also has set an AMA. So if you have any other questions or conversations that you want to bring over there, um, feel free to do that. And uh, yeah, we'll send over the recording tomorrow. So for now, enjoy your evening, everybody. Thank you, Henning, again. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.